is Melissa Ashman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. My dissertation research focuses on social justice and inclusive teaching. So throughout this presentation, you will hear me provide verbal descriptions of any images that I've included on my slides. Um, you might also notice that my slides are a little plain Jane. Um, this is intentional for reasons of accessibility. So a transcript of my speaking notes can be viewed um, at the URL on screen or you can scan the QR code if you want to view my notes and follow along. You got it? You're good? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so on this slide, you will see a map of British Columbia and Alberta with several colorful areas indicating the lands and territories of several First Nations. Um, I've included this image uh, to help provide context for my territorial land acknowledgement. So I'm an instructor at Kwantlen Polytechnic University, which is located in British Columbia, Canada. KPU shares its name with the Kwantlen Nation which is a First Nation located along the Fraser River. Uh, so in the lower left hand <laughs> quadrant of, this, of the image. Um, it's located along the Fraser River between Richmond and New Westminster in the west, Surrey and Langley in the south, Mission in the east, and Stave Lake in the north. KPU has five campuses, which are located on the unceded territories of the Kwantlen, Musqueam, Semiamu, Tawasin, Kikite, and Coquitlam peoples. I'm also a student in the Doctor of Education in Distance Education program at Athabasca University, which is located about an hour north of here on the, on, on the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cree and the Métis. And today I'm presenting to you from here in Edmonton, which is located within Treaty 6 territory within the Métis homelands and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. And there are traditional territories of many First Nations, including the Nihio, the Dene Salune, the Nakota Sioux, the Anish Anishinaabe, and the Nietzsche So Canada's history is rooted in colonization and the oppression and genocide of indigenous peoples. So providing land and territory acknowledgements at the beginning of meetings or gatherings is one small way to recognize the ongoing responsibility for supporting truth and reconciliation. And as a settler in Canada, I offer this acknowledgement to support truth and reconciliation and to help provide background and context for who I am and from where I come. I'm a member of the Global OER Graduate Network, which is also known as GoGN, which is represented by penguins, in this case presented on screen in an image by visual thinkery of one cartoon penguin giving another a piggyback ride while waving and carrying a white flag with the GoGN logo. And I'm really grateful for the financial support of GoGN to attend the OE Global Conference and the pre-conference workshop. So in my presentation today, I'm gonna to provide a little bit of background. Um, so if I'm gonna be asking you for feedback, you kinda of need to know <laughs> what I'm doing, what I'm wanting to do. I'll share my interview questions and we'll have a choose your own adventure activity for reviewing and providing feedback. So it's often assumed that open education by virtue of improving access to education automatically supports social justice, but this is not the case. And online learning is frequently thought to improve students' access to education, but the online environment can, in fact, be a site of social injustice for historically marginalized students. So as a result, using open pedagogy in an online course to support social justice requires intentionality on the part of the instructor. And I argue that social justice leadership is what makes this intentionality possible. So in other words, there are ways to use open pedagogy that do not support social justice, as shown by the yellow circle. And there are ways to engage in social justice that do not involve open pedagogy, um, as shown in the blue circle. And though there are reasons for developing social justice leadership that do not involve open pedagogy, I argue that engaging in open pedagogy to support social justice requires the development of social justice leadership. So it's that intersection of those two circles that I want to explore. So that we're all on the same page, I'm using the definition of open pedagogy provided by Hegarty, um, which is that open pedagogy has eight attributes. Um, participatory technologies, people, openness, and trust, 
innovation and creativity, sharing ideas and resources, connected community, learner-generated reflective practice and peer review. I'm using Nancy Fraser's definition of social justice, which is parody of participation. She states there can be economic, political, and cultural uh, social injustices, and remedies can be affirmative or transformative. And I'm using a definition of social justice leadership provided by Theo Harris, which is that it is a leadership approach that makes issues of race, class, gender, disability, sexual orientation, and other historically and currently marginalizing conditions central to the advocacy, leadership practice, and vision. I'm taking a critical approach to this, and my methodology will be uh, interpretive phenomenology. So my overarching research question is, what are the experiences of online faculty in using open pedagogy to support social justice? And I have three sub-questions. How do the faculty conceptualize social justice? How do they operationalize it using open pedagogy? And what strategies and approaches do they use to develop their social justice leadership? I plan to recruit faculty participants from my institution, which is KPU and to conduct two rounds of one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews um, with each consenting participant. So I'm gonna pause here for a little signpost. Um, I'm going to share my round one and round two interview questions with you, um, and then I will describe what the options are for providing feedback. We get to choose our own adventure, so you get to choose what works for you, um, and then we'll make some decisions. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, so the draft of my questions for the first interview, and I apologize, it's a little font, it's a little font. So the first question is asking people to um, share with me how they identify um, in however, um, in whatever identities um, they have. Second question is getting me, is I want to find out how their journey to using open pedagogy in online courses came about. Um, has it changed over time? Um, how are they using it? And what is their experience in using it? What does social justice mean to them? Um, and what does it mean to have a social justice perspective when using open pedagogy in an online course? Um, how do they support social justice by using open pedagogy? What strategies, approaches, and practices do they use to develop their social justice leadership? And is there anything else they want to talk about? So those are the first round questions, and I'll put them back on screen. <laughs> Second round uh, will involve asking them to review the transcript, elaborating on one or more topics. My plan is to uh, be analyzing each interview as it happens, like uh, immediately after it happens. Um, and then to see if their perspective on social justice or how they use open pedagogy to support social justice, or how they engage in social justice leadership development has changed since their last interview, and if there's anything else they want to talk about. So the kinds of feedback that I'm hoping to get, I welcome your feedback on anything, um, but in particular, will do you think my interview questions will provide me with the answers uh, to my research questions? Is the order of the questions appropriate? Sort of questions I should consider adding, removing, uh, shuffling around, um, and if you have any other feedback. So we have choose your own adventure. I have no idea if anyone is even joining online. If people are joining online, there's an online participation option. Um, otherwise, here in the room, we have three options. So option one is think, pair, square, share with all. Um, second one, I have some gigantic post-it notes that I've been carrying around all day that I can slap up on the wall and give you smaller post-it notes that you can use to add your ideas to it. Or there, if you're not feeling like talking with anyone or moving around, um, there is the digital option. So bit.ly slash Melissa Jamboard, or you can scan the QR code. What strikes your fancy? Yes? You want number one? We can all do different ones. Number one, yeah, we can do number one. Um, so if you uh, if you want to participate digitally, that's fine. Doesn't seem like anyone really wants to be adding paper to the wall, but if you want to, I'm I'm cool with that. Um, so yeah, I'll give you some time to find a partner or partners. 
So share, think, write down your ideas, and then your pair is going to square. You'll share and refine some more, and then we'll share with the group. I'll put them back on screen. And the objectives. Sorry? Can I do that? So the research questions you meant and the and the interview questions? Yeah, okay. Get it on one one slide, one page here. What I'm trying to do is put them side by side. Yeah. But now it makes it like super small. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I hope you brought your magnifying glasses. <laughs> I don't even know if you're going to be able to read the questions now, but. Yeah. Or you can, I can put the QR code for the, the transcript and then you'll have the research, uh, you'll have the questions in there. Yeah. yeah. And you'll also have the interview questions in the transcript too. So if you want to scan it again, um, here is the, the, the QR code. I will be interviewing them twice, so two rounds. So I'll do uh, one round of the first round of interview questions, which are up on screen, and then I will code and analyze and all that good stuff, and then I will do the follow-up interview. There's no intervention that I'm assessing or testing. Sorry, I can't hear you.
originally we were going to do some basic math. Two times two is four. Four. Is <laughs> four. Um, but we don't have that same number of people in the room. So if you are comfortable uh, just sharing out directly, um, we can do that. How about we start with this group? Okay. You want to start? Okay. Um, I think you're. Your research is really interesting. Um, I would like to do something like this. I mean, that's the kind of topics I'm going to address to. So, uh, and use qualitative tools a lot. Um, so I think it's interviewing is a good way of taking out evidence. Now, I don't know, I would go for a, for a yeah, you need a questionnaire, of course, but um, uh, I would say that the interview has to be uh, to involve the other person in a in free uh, thinking. You know, like uh, I was telling her, it's better to catch people off guard with a question that leads to the answer you want, and not a question that triggers the politically correct answer. Oh yeah, of course I believe in social justice and this is the, what I do. Like what what all of us have a like a, a narrative of what would be the right thing to say. Maybe yep. that has, doesn't necessarily have to do with what you actually end up doing for whatever reason. So I wouldn't go for uh, we all we both thought number two was was great because that will get you warmed up really good. They're used to talking about that. They probably have an elevator speech about, because um, it's their job. But question one is very a vulnerable question, so it should not be first. And I think Mariana didn't want it to be in there at all. <laughs> yeah, I think it should be in there, but not first. It should be later. And for me, question three is too big. What does social justice mean to you? You're either going to get a can't answer or a blank stare. It's too big. Um, like, so, um, yeah. Like, if you have, if you, you spend a lot of time reading definitions of social justice, but uh, your instructors probably do not necessarily have. Um, so I was wondering if, if you can help give them ideas. So I was wondering a question of, like, um, maybe something like which aspects of social, social justice resonate the most with you? Because there's lots of areas. Like I'm, I listed a bunch of refugees, immigration, um, racism, specific kinds of racism, gender diversity, sexual orientation, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there's so many, and someone might be like, feel super passionate about one, and the other, they still think it's important, but it doesn't, doesn't get them excited. Um, and I think having them talking about that too might help them jumpstart and also might give them outside of their canned answers because they're, they're, it's going to help them see the breath, maybe. Um, in five minutes. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, sure. Nishan, your group. Another thing that uh, I've been in marketing, uh, and we have done lots of research, when you do a session like that, you might have somebody who will give you very short answers, and there will be others who will kind of give you kind of more explanation. So in case if somebody just flies through these questions, I think it would be useful for you to have some additional prompts. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to hear from them what their experience is and how they're thinking about this. So I want to, I have to kind of tread that fine line between providing information that's going to push them in a direction that they think they should go versus just, because I mean, it could be that they can't actually conceptualize and like articulate. So, you know, how they're supporting social justice or what it is. So, I think that would be very revealing. Uh, so, thank you. Group at the back. I'm not going to put you on the spot if you're like, we just want to. Yeah. For the social justice leadership, you mean? Thank you. Yep. evaporated but it's come back um, so with question one so I gave this a version of this talk last week uh, with the GoGN workshop and there was almost the entire Q&A focused on question number one so I want to say thank you for providing feedback on the other questions um, as well um, so to provide some context um, and some background, I won't necessarily be reporting on the specifics of number one, but I will be able to report and say we had a variety of genders, a variety of races, a variety of uh, you know, abilities, um, et cetera, rather than because of sample size as well, I don't want to potentially be having someone be identifiable. That would not be a good thing. Um, Oh, yeah, it'll be through Zoom or it'll be through Teams, one or the other, and recorded, and then transcribed, and then coded. <laughs>
how do they advocate for this or champion for this with others? So our institution, um, we are a teaching institution. Um, so full-time faculty teach four and four or eight courses over the semester. And we don't, we are not obligated to do research. It's considered a bonus. We are required to engage in like scholarly activity, but we don't necessarily have to be applying for research grants and stuff, so. Great, thank you. Yes. I also think um, it's it's important that these questions tap into their biographies, like not only their professional um, curriculum, but you know we become the professionals we become also because we have a certain life. Rich data. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought about that. Haven't quite come up with a solution, but I thought about it. Yeah, and that is that is a concern that I have. Um, I've had people suggest that I try to recruit across institutions, um, which makes my head spin a little bit in trying to navigate different REB for, but I think BC has a streamlined, streamlined process. Um, and doing two rounds of interviews. So how many how many rounds of interviews do I need to like are enough collectively for the perspective and the the, the methodology that I'm using? So, yep. Wait, wait. So across institutions, are you thinking globally, BC, 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 BC? Yeah, my my um, institution of study is here in Alberta, um, and. 
there has been communication and like other students at KPU, uh, other faculty at KPU who have gone through the AU program and so the REB, can like, they talk to each other very well. Um, and I think BC has a streamlined process, um, but trying to navigate to other institutions or even identify out of province institutions or putting the project in an entirely different context of like a global perspective, that's, yeah. Are you Um, like within, if I stick within KPU, um, it will be a university and will be a single university um, and it will be across disciplines, okay. across disciplines. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, in in an ideal world where, I'll be honest, where I'm not paying tuition <laughs> to, because my, my doctoral work is not funded, where I'm not having to pay money to do this, I would be doing a very different, bigger study. I'd be getting student perspectives, and but um, in the timeline of wanting to not go into too much debt, unfortunately. A good dissertation is a done dissertation. Yeah, so I'm, I'm like maybe next project number two, <laughs> project number two, stage two. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. I really appreciate it. <laughs>